This is Sarah Wilkinson from Humber College and the University of Guelph Humber. In this video, I'm going to cover the sliding filament theory. I would recommend you watch the first two videos in this series on muscle features and the neuromuscular junction before continuing on to this one. Please note that I'm going to be discussing purely shortening contraction. Recall that the muscle's fiber is the cell and that it's packed full of myofibrils. If we look closely at a myofibril, it will contain many protein filaments that form sarcomeres. Let's take a closer look at this sarcomere. There are a number of important proteins you need to know. First is myosin, which forms the thick filament. The second is actin, which forms the thin filament. In addition, there's two other proteins one being troponin, which will bind to calcium, and the second being tropomyosin, which blocks the active site on actin. We'll cover these in more detail in this video. When the sarcomere shortens, the thin filament slides over the thick filament. Now, as you'll recall, the sarcomere is the repeating functional unit in myofibrils so that if you have a series of sarcomeres beside one another, they form the entire length of the myofibril. And that if the sarcomeres are to shorten, the myofibril will shorten and therefore the muscle will be shortened. In a previous video, we covered how an action potential travels down the motor neuron to the neuromuscular junction. From the neuromuscular junction, the action potential will travel across the sarcolemma and down the T-tubule. As the action potential travels down the T-tubule, this causes the release of calcium from the sarcoplasmic reticulum into the sarcoplasm. I left off the previous video indicating that calcium released into the sarcoplasm is going to trigger muscle contraction. That's where we'll start today. So let's take a deeper look at the thick filament, which is made up of myosin. I'm going to illustrate the thick filament with these little animations. So here's my mice and heads that you'll see in this video can actually move to pull the thin filament. I'm going to illustrate the thin filament in this way today. So let's start at rest. The active sites on actin are covered by tropomyosin. In response to an action potential, calcium will be released from the sarcoplasmic reticulum and will bind to troponin. This will cause troponin molecules to move, which will move tropomyosin off the active site of actin, leaving them exposed. Once the active sites on actin are exposed, myosin heads can bind to them. And we call this a cross bridge. After the cross bridge has formed, the myosin head can pivot and pull actin towards the center of the sarcomere. We call this a power stroke. Once the power stroke has occurred, the myosin head can detach and reset to be able to bind again. You're probably wondering, how does the myosin head attach to actin, pivot, detach, and reset? Let's go through that now. The energized myosin head has a phosphate and adenosine diphosphate group attached to it. When the tropomyosin molecule moves away from the active sites on actin, myosin heads will automatically bind. When the phosphate and ADP molecules are released, this will cause the myosin head to pivot, moving actin. Again, we call this the power stroke. ATP will then bind to the myosin head, causing it to detach from actin. Energy released from the hydrolysis of ATP will reset the myosin head to its original position. It can now reattach to actin as long as the active sites are open. Another power stroke will occur because ADP and phosphate are released and this cross bridge cycle will continue. As long as calcium is bound to troponin, 
all myosin heads will attach and detach using this mechanism so that the sarcomeres shorten and the muscle shortens. However, once the stimulus is removed, that is the action potential, ATP is used to pump calcium back into the sarcoplasmic reticulum. Because calcium is no longer attached to troponin, it will move tropomyosin back over the binding sites of actin, as you can see here. And myosin heads can no longer attach to the active sites. In the previous video on the neuromuscular junction, I covered the steps involved in the motor neuron communicating with the muscle cell. The final steps was the actual potential moving down each tubule, causing the release of calcium ions from the sarcoplasmic reticulum. In this video, we've covered that calcium ions can then bind to troponin, which will move tropomyosin off the active sites on actin, and a contraction can occur. The steps that are repeated over and over in a contraction are that the myosin head will bind to actin, ADP and phosphate are released, which will cause myosin head to pivot, moving actin towards the center line. ATP will then bind to myosin, causing it to detach from actin. And the energy released from the hydrolysis of ATP is used to reset the myosin head so that it can rebind to actin. Once the stimulus is removed, the calcium will be returned to the sarcoplasmic reticulum and troponin will move tropomyosin back over the binding sites so that contraction is discontinued.